thank you all for coming. This is, you know, every, we've had retreats now for five years, and every year the retreat has gotten bigger and bigger, and this is by far our biggest retreat. Um, and we really appreciate you all coming. We're going to use you today, as, as, many, as many mentioned. You're here, we hope, to help us to think about how we can do better. Um, and uh, in, in our interest in growing as an organization um, is real, and um, we're, we really need your, your input and are expecting it today. So first, before I start, let me explain the arm. Um, I've, I don't know how many hundreds of times I've explained it, so this way I can explain it to a whole group of folks all at once. So I broke my ulnar styloid, um, not this last Saturday, but the Saturday before, so about 10 days ago. I was uh, horsing around with my kids, um, simple, you know, playing around like you usually do, running around the house, stumbled and land into a countertop a lot like that one, just like this, broke my styloid. Um, and it's a big pain. Six weeks ago, I did this to myself, also with my kids. Um, I've said it's a skateboarding accident. I wasn't actually on the skateboard. <laughs> my seven-year-old was, and I was trying to keep him out of some broken glass and tripped into a, you know, a tree well and struck the asphalt with my chin and the blood everywhere. and. Um, it, yeah, it was a, a big mess. So the wonderful thing about having young children, mine are seven and nine, is that they keep you feeling young. <laughs> but the reality is very different <laughs> from, from the feeling. So, uh, so anyway, just uh, hopefully I'll learn to be less clumsy. So last year, I presented a little story to sort of kick us off. And it was, it was a story of my, my son, Teo. He was eight at that time. And he you might remember he talked about why is a train stop here. And I told a story about a train in Colorado that we had taken. We were on a family trip in Colorado that sort of just ended nowhere. And we talked about how that train had actually been part of a large network. And that network had developed after 19, 1857. So 1857, just a few trains out west. And then the trains reaching a peak in 1918 with trains everywhere and then trimmed down dramatically to what you, what you see in 2006. And we talked about how trains um, represented a kind of um, uh, a transition, uh, both in terms of the technologies and the systems, that they were the, the biggest industry for a while, and then, and then, uh, and then they, they uh, came crashing down, and now maybe are being revisited. So now this year, I went back to Colorado again. So why do I go back to Colorado? My family's from Colorado, so I went back to visit the folks again in, in Colorado. And, and this year, I'm going to tell a story about this town. It's in some ways a similar story, but I, I, think, uh, I think it's useful um, in thinking about what we're hoping we can, we can do together today. So this actually is probably what this town looked like in 1850. Um, nothing there, really. Um, this is actually just down the street from where the town actually is. Um, in, but, a, you know, a, a beautiful valley up in the mountains of Colorado. But then, in 1859, they discovered gold. And this is an actual um, rock, ingot, whatever you call it, for, of gold that was found in, in this town in Colorado. Had a huge impact, no surprise. I mean, 1849 here, 1859 in Colorado. Um, and with that, there were a collection of miners that came in and then people that supported them. And they decided they needed the post office. They needed the only post office that would be between Denver and um, Salt Lake City. And so they applied for it. And they decided to use the name of the guy on the right. And he was a vice, vice president um, with uh, James Buchanan at the time. I blocked out his name because I'm trying to, I'm going to tease you a little bit about what, ta what this town is. Um, and uh, it ended up that later, this guy, he, uh, he went to the Confederate side. Um, and this was right around the time this, these were Democrats. He was a Southerner. Went, and so the town changed its name by misspelling his name. So another little clue to where we're talking about. But they misspelled his name, and that's become the name of this town. Um, by the late 1800s, the town looked like this. Um, so a thriving town, lots of buildings. This is, I can't quite date this. It's got to be a little later than late 1800s, but it, it looks something like this. 
So what about population? Well, in 1850, the estimates were that there were three people in, in this town. In 1860, with, the, with finding all that gold, the population went up to about 500. There aren't good numbers, but that's what they think it was. Um, and that's when um, they applied for the post office and all of that. Um, but already by 1870, things had changed. Um, they got the easy gold sitting there on the surface, um, and then there was easier gold elsewhere. And so it, the town dramatically shrunk. But then, then they developed a new technology. And this is not a picture from, from this town, but it, it could have been. It looks just like this. This is um, hydraulic mining. And what they do is they just disrupt the earth, break up the rocks, so that you can get to the, ores, the ore much more quickly. And of course, it's very destructive. Um, and they did this all through this valley. So you know, it, it, when I was a kid, actually, the valley looked very much like this, with rocks everywhere. So with that came a, um, an increase in the population so that by 1880, the population was, now we're on a different scale, the population was, our, was all the way back up to 1,700. So lots more people required, lots more gold, also silver pulled out. But then, of course, that dried up as well. And the population went down and down and down. So that actually in, in 1936, they dropped Breckenridge from the, the US maps, the official US maps, even though it still did have a post office. And so it declared itself as a kingdom. <laughs> and it still celebrates being a kingdom today. That continued to drop until skiing was discovered. So this is an old picture from the 1960s, uh, an advertisement to bring people to skiing. But important for this town, too, was in order to get there from any major metropolitan area, you had to drive through this tunnel. Or before that, it was Loveland Pass, long way up and over, closed all the time. You know, as a kid, we, we started a little avalanche that closed it down. So if I could do that, you know, you know it's going gonna, it's gonna to close down frequently. Um, Open this tunnel up in, in the 1970s. That had a huge impact on the, on the town. And then they... This is actually a current picture. There's still these piles lying around, but the, um, they cleaned up almost all of these big piles and turned the river that runs through the valley into a beautiful river and added a, added a, a biking trail. And what happened then over time is, I mean, you know the rest of the story, the population went way up. And it wasn't just the population that lives there. This actually became the number one ski area, the most visited ski area in North America, and it still vacillates around there with, um, with a couple other places. So I think I said it by accident, but the name is, this is Breckenridge, so his name is actually not spelled that way. That's the way the town spelled it. It was spelled with an I, and they changed it um, to an E to, uh, to diss him, um, and this is what it looks like today. So the, word, the key word today is sustainability. And obviously, this is a town that went through dramatic changes over a long period of time. Um, and they were changes that were forced on it by um, you know, shifts in the economics, you know, what's valuable, shifts in technology, shifts in population, shifts in culture and what people did. It took way too long for that town to make changes. But of course, it, you know, that was typical for, for uh, what was possible at that time. So what, what about us? Why are we talking about this? Well, we have serious drivers for change. We can't just exist like we always have or like we even do today. And first, let me just take a step back and say, we, that's never been true for us, right? We've changed dramatically from year one to where we are today. We're a very, very different organization. I think the retreat is, uh, demonstrates that. But your activities, those of you who are doing work within CTSI, really demonstrate that, how they've changed over time, how, um, how uh, we've created brand new programs, how uh, we've created brand new opportunities. So what are our drivers? Well, we know that the systems need improvement. And you know, we've talked about this doubling of NIH budget without a doubling of return. That's one um, demonstration of that. But we're just not run like a responsive business, right? Academia has been um, uh, entrenched in tradition. 
um, and that's slowed it down in terms of being uh, adaptive and providing the optimal services. Um, we are charged in our CTSA grant with innovating, not just with doing stuff, but solving these bigger problems, and not just solving them for UCSF, but moving them beyond UCSF. Um, and so we got to do that if we're going to survive and continue to get NIH funding. We know now that our core support will change. We have the new announcement, and we know that the support that we get from NIH is going to go down. It's going to go down somewhere between 15 and 30 percent. Um, and so we've known, we've anticipated that that was the case. And so that means, too, that we can't rely on stable funding from NIH for our programs, and we need to move on to thinking about not just sustaining, but growing in spite of that um, uh, expected, or really promised, um, decrease in core support. Also, the other thing is that we, we've talked about this a lot, is that we want to define our mission. We know that we're, you know, about accelerating research to improve health. We know that. NIH has been great in terms of it, it, getting us to embark on this mission together, but we, you know, we changed, actually, to, from reporting into um, NCRR, National Center for Research Resources, into NCATS, National Center for Accelerating Translational Sciences, in this past year. NCATS has a different agenda than we were given before. And even though they've given us freedom to define our agenda as broadly as we have today, and we've, we're fortunate that that's the case, we still would rather not be saying, well, what is it that NIH wants us to do? We should do what they want us to do, but we also want the freedom to do what we think needs to get done. That means having support that comes not just from NIH, but from other, other sources. And we need to envision what would happen to all this great work if the NIH funding went away. And we know that one of our, our um, one of the institutions that went in with us initially has now um, failed to recompete twice and won't be funded. Um, and that's a fantastic institution, the only one that did better than us when we first went in. That was that's Duke. So it is not secure that we will get this funding. So we need to think, too, about, about how can we exist, how do we survive, even if we had no NIH funding. So those are strong drivers. I'm not trying to scare everybody. We do have stable funding. We did great in the renewal. We are such a strong program. I can't imagine that harm is going to happen to us. On the other hand, we really should be thinking about diversifying the sources that come in to support the work that we're doing. Okay, so we set out to do this already. We thought about this, and we put this into our renewal. And I showed this last year, that we sort of, uh, our goal is to get to 50 percent of our support coming from non-NIH sources. So here from recharge or institutional support or from industry and philanthropy. So how are we doing so far? Well, it ends up, many didn't want me to show you this, that it, because it, we probably set the goal a little too low for ourselves, because we're actually really close to that already this year. I mean, we made some changes, definitely, but we're already at 45, 55 percent NIH, 45 percent coming from other sources. Um, some of this, too, it may get a little worse next year, because we also don't want to be distracted by missions that aren't our core mission. This is something we really need to talk about. Some of the resources that are brought in are not in our core mission, and we've got to think about actually reducing that support, um, that, that source of revenue over time, or better justifying it as uh, making sense for the overall institution. Okay, so how do we, how, how do, we do this? How, you know, what, um, how do we even know whether we're on the right course for doing this? Well, I'm just going to show you kind of the way I think of this right now. Um, I just chose CRS because it's a huge program, and this is a really big issue for, for CRS. You know, um, a, the, this is clinical research services, um, and it includes all the, um, the clinical research centers and a big hunk of what CTSI does and what um, we do that's very useful to investigators. So CRS is meeting the needs of the uh, investigators um, and I, I'm sorry about this image of investigators. We're not all kind of like that. But anyway, it's a, it's a <laughs> and, and these very happy patients, you know, these, uh, the, the population that we're caring, you know, that we're, we're treating, bringing into our studies. Um, so it's, it, it's meeting those, 
those goals, and it gets some feedback from, from them to, to change what it does. And then, of course, CRS reports into CTSI, and this is where we've got this sort of, uh, some might say painful, sorry, Fabrice, process of, of sort of judging what CRS is doing and having a review, which can't be perfect, right? It's got to, it, there's, it's an abstract of what they really do, and it's always polished before it's presented, and then they're difficult and easy things to assess in that review process. So, so already there's a, you know, with us judging what they're doing, we're, we're losing something in terms of accuracy of us directing them. Um, but then, of course, we report to NIH, right? And CRS knows that, and so they're now, they've got metrics, too, that they're reporting to NIH, which may not be that relevant to whether we're meeting the needs of investigators or patients, right? So all of a sudden, we've got this cascading away from what our core mission is. And then, of course, they report to Congress. And then Congress tells them what to do, which may be different from what they're telling us to do. And then that leads to, oh, my goodness. So the, them actually meeting their mission because of the way we're, we're managed and orchestrated is, is very different from them thinking in a focused manner about how best can I solve the problems? Can I meet the needs of the investigator community and the participants that, that they bring in? That's the core question, right? How can I do this better from CRS's perspective? How, what are their needs? How do I best meet them within whatever constraints I have? Now, of course, a capitalistic system does that, right? So capitalism, this is whether you're, you know, wherever you are on the political sp spectrum, this is one thing that capitalism does. It aligns the CRS's delivery to the needs. If people aren't going to pay for it, then you probably haven't provided a service that's worthwhile to them. Now, of course, if they can't pay for it, that's a different story. You need to figure out why and solve that problem. Also, if it's a service that they can't get their job done without it, too, that may be a place, too, where you want to want to intervene. But at least having some element of what we're doing being responsive to the needs creates a kind of automatic governance that guides itself. And that's one side effect that's actually advantageous about us thinking about these sorts of aspects of sustainability. So it's not just a distraction. It actually can be useful as a more sort of proximate governance strategy, um, more responsive um, to our communities. Okay, so key questions for today. I haven't seen the five minute thing go up, so I must be doing okay. Um, who, who benefits when we meet our mission? So this is a question that we all need to, to be asking. You know, so we want to benefit everyone, right? We want to benefit our community. Who is that community? What it, who is it that's benefiting? Of those, who's willing to support that work? Um, can we do a better job of meeting that group's needs? So if, we're, if they're kind of, yeah, you're pretty good, but if you did this, you'd be better. Um, that we want to know, right? So then we can adapt to that and grow and, and modify what it is we do over time. And then the last question is, does this distract us from our mission or allow us to meet it better? So if we're running a business to support our mission, that could very well be a distraction. However, if running our, if if running parts of our, of our, what we do as a business supports our mission and allows us to expand what we do, then that's a good thing. And we fortunately have the luxury, at least right now, with other sources of, of revenue to, to think creatively about where, where we can and where we should not look for other sources of revenue. Okay, so. Um, we really do have a great retreat to, today. Um, so we've got about 260 people here in the audience. You all are key ingredients to our success. Thank you very much for, for coming. And it should be a, a really interesting uh, retreat. So um, I, I think you made the right decision about a way to spend your, your afternoon. Um, we've got many of our, our campus leaders, and we really appreciate you all coming to um, and uh, uh, working with us. We have some superstar panelists, um, one of which I don't see. Oh, uh, the first two are here. Um, and you'll see a bunch of, of several others, and thrilled to, to have them as well. Um, and I think, um, too, that you all will see, and we hope that you'll see, that your presence here is worthwhile and that we really are serious about um, gathering input to think about how 
uh, we can do uh, what we do better.